began in the year 250. The epidemic spread, it was a form of a plague, spread from Ethiopia across North Africa, eventually to Italy and across the Western Empire. It lasted some 15 to 20 years. At one point, they said that on one day alone, 5,000 people died in Rome from this plague. The uh, emperor at the time, emperor decided that it had to be the Christians' fault for the plague, ordered the Christians all to bow to the gods or to face punishment because of it. Christians lost their lives, and what happened was is that Christians decided, and this especially happened in Carthage. In Carthage, <clears throat> the bishop of Carthage said, we're going to go out and we're going to take the bodies that are lying on the streets of those who have died, who have been left there by their families, and we're going to bury those bodies. We're going to go out on the streets and we're going to find those who are still sick and dying, and we're going to minister to them and we're going to care for them. In fact, Christianity became even much more of this medical kind of treatment. I mean, hospitals around the world today really come out of the movement back in those days when Christians started giving medical care, hospital forms of care to people who were dying. In many cases, they were risking their own lives. They actually spent money and, and hired uh, unemployed people to help bury the people who had died. The, the bishop um, <clears throat> of Carthage actually continued doing this for about five years. In fact, his name is Cyprian. You may have heard his name because the plague is called the Plague of Cyprian. And it's because of what Cyprian had actually done to try to help the people. After five years, he's exiled because he was a Christian and got in trouble for all the work that he had been doing. But here's the interesting thing that happened because of this. This is probably one of the things that added to the spread across the Roman Empire. Ultimately, the, the emperor of Rome and some believe he, his, his mom and some believe he actually accepted Christ. Why? Constantine, right? Because of the movement of the church to go into the streets to care for the hurting, the poor, the dying, the sick, and those who had already died. The people that, the, that, that the, their own families had thrown out those people were the people that the Christians welcomed in. And think about that as the nation continues. Masses of people have been touched and blessed by Christians and it's no wonder that Rome became a Christian community because of the influence of people who were willing to risk all to go care for people in need. Mark, the seventh chapter. We're going to start at verse 24. <clears throat> Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He ent entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the dogs, excuse me, to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, For such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's look back a little bit, because when you want to catch up to where we're at, we had last week, we didn't, weren't in Mark. Some of you are new here, didn't hear this passage and also. Let's just get to the context again. You might remember that Jesus fed 5,000 people. 
at least 5,000 men. So it may have been that he's fed more like 15,000 or more. We don't know. But a minimum was he fed 5,000 men from two fish and five barley loaves. It really meant five crackers. He feeds them, and then he tells the disciples, okay, you guys, you're tired. Go on across the lake. This is after they've just come back from an incredible time of ministering and witnessing to people. They've been healing the sick, casting out demons, calling people to repentance and saying, hey, the Messiah is here. They've come back celebrating all kinds of things of what God has done. They're amazed by the miracles that have taken place. And they come back to meet with Jesus. He invites them to feed the 5,000 since they've been doing so many miracles. He tells them to feed the 5,000. Basically, he will actually give them what they need to be able to feed the 5,000. They're all worn out. He sends them across the lake, and he heads up the mountain to pray. While he's up there praying and watching them out on the boat, he realizes that they're getting nowhere. Because a great storm has come up, the waves are high, the boat's getting nowhere, they're trying to row, and they're continuing to stay in the same place. So he decides to go walk out and help them. He walks across the water, but starts to go by them, because he's just kind of checking on them to make sure that they're okay in the boat. And, and they all get a little bit scared, because there's this guy that looks like a ghost. They start hollering and screaming. Mark doesn't tell us this part of the story, even though Peter's the one reminding Mark about what all had happened. But... but Matthew lets us know that Peter decides to get out of the boat. He actually says, Jesus, if that's really you, then tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water until he realizes that men don't walk on water. And then he starts to sink, which is the natural thing that you should do when you jump into the water, right? Only now he's scared because the water's going to drown him. He starts crying out. Jesus walks over to him because Jesus can walk on the water, reaches down, pull, pulls him up, puts him back in the boat, and, and you know, talks to him about his faith. Now, the interesting thing is I just need to keep reminding you of this one, and that is, is that Peter got out of the boat. What about the rest of the disciples who were inside the boat? Okay. We always like to pick on Peter because he shows this lack of faith. Really? Lack of faith? How many of you would have gotten out of the boat? Okay? Come on. Think about that. You're actually going to get out on that water? No way. So, so let's not be too harsh on somebody else who we think operates with a lack of faith. So they get in the boat. They go to the shore. They end up at a totally different place where they had been starting out trying to go because the wind had totally moved them. They get over there, and guess what happens? Not only some hearing, healings take place, but some friends have come from Jerusalem. Well, not really friends. Some inspectors. We call them religious people. Uh, they were called Pharisees. And they realize that Jesus' disciples are not doing the ceremonial cleansing that you're supposed to do during a meal. And, and it, remember, for those of you who are here, we actually tried to demonstrate there's quite a process that you had to go through. Water down, water down, water down. Raise up, raise up. Dry, dry. No, now, don't say anything. Pray. Again, clean up. Now you can talk. Okay, I mean, and guess what? You didn't just do that once, but you had to do it several times. And the Pharisees, look, you men, they're not doing this ceremonial cleansing that you know the elders from old have told us to do. And Jesus points out it's not about the elders, it's about the word of God. And you guys aren't even following the basic commandments. You don't even care for your mother and your father like the word of God says. In fact, you use something very spiritual, and that spiritual thing is called Corbin, in which you say, bless I'm going to give what I have to bless God, Corbin. Instead, you do that so that you don't have to give it to mom and dad when they're old. It's a way to get out of taking care of them, right? <laughs> well, this belongs to God. Sorry, mom, dad, can't give it to you, can't help you out because it belongs to God. And, and Jesus says, look, you go totally even against the commandments. So forget about what the, 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 the saints of old have been saying, the scribes and the religious people, you know, because they came up with all kinds of rules. And bottom line is, and here's here he gets really friendly, right? I mean, this is where he, he this, is where, this is where the Pharisees become emotional, it's true. Think about it, right? They become emotional. This is where they become passionate about Jesus Christ because he calls them hypocrites. And he quotes from Isaiah and he says, you worship me with your lips, but not with your heart. Whoa. 
And Lord, help us not to be that way, to go through the motions on a Sunday morning, to do things with our lips, to sing the songs, to pray the prayers, to, to act real spiritual, but in our hearts not to be in tune with Jesus Christ. And with that, we come to our story today. And it says that Jesus takes the disciples and they, what? They head out of Galilee. They were probably in Capernaum, which is, a, and did I have that slide? Okay. They, they were probably there at, at Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. Capernaum's up on the north uh, uh, western part of the Sea of Galilee. You might see the dot up there at the top. And they start heading out towards what's called Phoenicia, which is, do some of you remember the northern kingdom? The northern kingdom, it's, it's the kingdom that no longer exists. Right? It's Israel that got destroyed in 723. Why? Because they were worshiping idols. Because you remember when Joshua was told to take over the land, they were told wherever you put your foot, that's your land, but you also got to clear out the idols. You got to clear out all the idol worshipers. It's one of those stories that people kind of don't like because it meant that whole families had to be destroyed. And what happened? Well, up in Phoenicia, they didn't do it. Well, several places, but this is a very significant place because they didn't do it there. They didn't do it over in Tyre. And do you remember who comes from Tyre? It's a really special, energetic lady. In fact, she was so committed to her faith that she pursued the prophet of God to kill him. Her name was Jezebel, a pretty nasty gal. And Jezebel was from Tyre. This area is known as the land of the Canaanites. Canaanites, Hittites, all that, right? Canaanites, they were supposed to be removed from the land, right? But where are they? Still there. And ultimately, it causes the destruction of the, of the northern kingdom, and we have no idea where they are today because they were taken away in bondage, and they never came back. Southern kingdom is what we now refer to as Israel. It's known also as Judah. It's the southern kingdom that had a couple of good kings. It's the southern kingdom from which we now have the remnant of Israel still present. So Jesus, what's he do? He goes up to this community to get away from whom? I think he's getting away from the Pharisees. I think he's getting away from all the different kinds of people that are really becoming hostile towards him. See, even Jesus needs break, doesn't he? He's just called the Pharisees hypocrites. That's not going to get them um, supporting him very well, are they? They've already been planning his death. They've already been plotting details about how they're going to kill him. They've come there to prove that he's uh, not God. And he's getting away from them. He takes this journey out towards the coast. And in fact, this map actually kind of discusses, shows you if you follow the arrows. He goes out to the coast. And then in verse 31, it's actually going to say that Je then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, Sidon to the north. And then he goes down to the Sea of Galilee. Does anybody notice that that's not a very direct route to the Sea of Galilee? <laughs> not at all. I mean, in fact, the easy way is just come back to Capernaum. No, Jesus is going to go up to Sidon. He's going to go across the, the hills and all through the, some of the desert area. He's, he's going to go over into what's really known as modern Syria. He's going to come down in through the, what's called the, Deco the Decapolis, is where nine different cities and all, all totally, totally pagan cultures and all. Um, in fact, Leslie can show you a picture sometime of a place that we went to where they actually threw bodies, people, live, live people. They threw them down into the cavern, and um, if, they, if they saw blood come out, well, then the person was okay. <laughs> Either way, they're dying, so it didn't matter, but, but they could decide, you know, just what happened, you know, whether they saw the blood or not, you know, whether they were okay or not, but now it's too late, they're not okay. <laughs> um, and so these are some of the places that, that Jesus is going through, and eventually, and this is all, by the way, the last year of his ministry. Now, that ought to say something to you, too, doesn't it? There's a couple things that are important to Jesus in the last year of his ministry. One of those things is he can't die until Passover. Okay? So he's got to avoid the people who want to kill him. But he's also got to avoid the people who want to make him king. Right? So he's staying away from all those people because they're trying to set up something militarily, which is also going to cause a problem for him. But then the most important thing that he's trying to do this last year is what? 
It's the theme of this whole series. He's making disciples. Out of the 12 men that he's walking around this countryside with, he's making them into disciples. He's teaching them to obey all the things that he's teaching to them, all the commandments that he's giving them. He's showing them how to live like him, for him, to be devoted to him. And he's even demonstrating that by what he's doing as he's heading out here to Tyre. Because what, it, what is the other thing that he also just said to the disciples? He had this kind of crazy little conversation about what goes into you doesn't make you unclean. It's only what comes out. And what comes out is what comes out of your heart that's really what's making you unclean. They don't get it. He calls them dull. The literal translation is stupid. I'm sorry. He's just, you guys, you're totally missing it here. And then now they go out here, and now what's he doing? He's going out to show them the people that they think are unclean. And who are they? Us. <laughs> the Gentiles. <laughs> We're the ones who are unclean. She's a Canaanite woman from Tyre. She's, she's an idol worshiper. She uh, should have been destroyed. She shouldn't even be alive. And yet... This lady comes up to Jesus and wants her daughter healed. Healed of what? Healed of a demon. There's some things that I want us to try to get out of this text, and you see if you don't see them here as well. The first thing is this. Jesus loves the world. I mean, isn't that the message? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus loved the world the world. Genesis 12, 3, God calls Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you. In fact, he's even going to change his name and all. He's making this holy covenant with him. And he says, I'm going to bless you. What? So that you can become wealthy? So you can have lots of kids, right? Actually, both of those things. But ultimately, he says, so that all the what? Nations of the world will be blessed through you. God's concern is for the world. Well, maybe that was just for Abraham, right? No. Isaiah comes back. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for who? Some translation says the nations. Other translation says the Gentiles. They're the same thing. I will make you a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind. See if this sounds like Jesus. To free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Isn't that what Jesus stood up in the, town, in the, in the synagogue of Nazareth and said? This is, it's a similar scripture. It's a different one, but similar. This is being right now fulfilled right in front of you. I'm coming to set people free. Isaiah 49, 6. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. It's not just enough for you to reach the tribes of Israel. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. God loves the world. The world. And he's demonstrating that right here for his disciples who have just heard him say, no food is unclean. Which really is the message he's going to give to Peter later to send him to Cornelius, who's a Gentile. See, Peter's getting it. He's starting to understand the lesson. And as he's telling the story back to Mark, he's saying, oh yeah, as soon as he said that and talked about unclean food, we went and found this Syrophoenician lady. Soon as Peter has his dream about, about everything is clean, what happens? He goes and finds Cornelius, a man, Gentile, and shares Christ with him. You see, Jesus came for the nations, didn't he? Really? Go back to Luke 2. Simeon's in the temple, and he's, a, and he's been told he's not going to die until he sees what? The anointed one of God, the Messiah. And, and he sees this little baby and he takes him in his hand and he begins to celebrate. And he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, 
which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. It's what Paul reminds us of in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to whom? To the Jews. Then to whom? The Gentiles, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Or it's Paul in Antioch when he says, when the Jews saw the crowds, chapter 13, 45, he says, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. <laughs> what crowds? The crowds in Antioch who are coming to hear Paul preach about Jesus Christ who's been crucified and risen from the dead and is offering salvation to all who will believe in him. The crowds that are coming... When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Kind of like what some people do when they drive by another church that's not their church and they get jealous of what's in the parking lot there. Do we ever do that? No. I'm sorry, are you even catching what I'm saying? The jealousy that we sometimes have as Christians against other Christians, churches against other churches. I thought we were all on the same team, right? When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it, he's talking to the Jews, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Isn't it what we've been trying to study now since we began, Mark? It's the Great Commission. Go into what? All the world. Speaking to all the nations, to all peoples. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and of the Holy Spirit. Luke, excuse me, Luke said it this way in last chapter, 24, verse 47. When he's describing the Great Commission, in his words, he says, And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Luke also re records for us that Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and pray and wait for the Holy Spirit. While you're praying and waiting, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will become my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where it starts. Jere Ju Ju Judea, Samaria. That's out there, the edges. People that speak your language, but they're different from you. And to the other most parts of the world, people who probably don't speak your language, they're different from you. They're totally different cultures and all. That's like Indonesia last week, isn't it? Jesus loves the world. Do you get it? It's so important for us to understand. The Great Commission hinges on this fact that Jesus loves the world. And he invites us, if we're going to go make disciples, to do what? To love the world. Jesus responds to faith as well. It's an interesting lady here. Like I said already, she's a Canaanite woman from the city that, and in fact, let's, let's look at Matthew and see how Matthew describes this same setting. Matthew 15, verse 22 through 28. A Canaanite woman, that's that bad woman, from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him. See, the disciples think that Jesus doesn't care about this woman. She's over there bugging him. And so, so they say, Jesus, send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. Okay, she's a pest. She's bugging us. She's like this gnat, and you're hearing this yeeing going around our ear. Jesus, just get rid of her, please. And Jesus responds in a way that they think, oh, maybe he's on our side. I was sent only to the sheep of Israel. Yes, Jesus. And that's a Canaanite, and she's definitely not sheep of Israel. And get rid of her. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. How would you feel if you were called a dog? 
By Jesus, yeah. How would you feel if you were called a, uh, pardon my Latin here, a female dog? <laughs> By Jesus. Well, we need to clarify a little bit. There are two different kinds of dogs that, that they had in that day. There were the, the big dogs that ran the streets. They were nasty, messy, ate the junk and garbage and stuff like that. Could, could you know, harm people and all. Okay, that's the big dogs. That's not the word Jesus uses here. Whew. But he still calls her a dog, okay? But the word that he used is more like, okay, the puppy dogs, the, the lap dogs. There were dogs that they had in their houses, little dogs, that, that would do what? Well, when you're at a, eating at the table, we have a little cat named Macy. Macy sits right next to me when I'm sitting at the table. She always smiles. You know cats smile too, right? She always smiles and just waits. Sometimes way too long <laughs> till I finally ignore her or somehow give in. But because what she's waiting for what's going to fall off the table. And at our house, we're not supposed to let food fall on the floor. Don't know about yours. Well, in, in the Roman house, you not only let stuff fall, but you actually took bread and you would actually wipe your fingers on the bread and then you'd fling the bread. So guess what? The dogs knew there's going to be food coming real soon. <laughs> you know, gravy on bread, okay? And so the dog, the, the, and these were the puppy dogs. These were the little dogs. These were not the street dogs. So, so he at least uses a nicer name. But he still calls her a dog. Because in fact... In fact, she is. She's not acceptable in Judaism. She's Canaanite, makes her worse. She's from Phoenicia, which means they don't like her. She, she doesn't follow God. She follows other, other idols and all. So get rid of her, Jesus! And Jesus responds. It's, it's not right. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Well, really? Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Do you realize that Jesus only said that a couple of times? And that the times that he said it, he spoke to Gentiles? Yeah. Pharisees love that. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. What does the woman say? Have mercy on me. Oh my, do you get that? Jesus, I need you. I know I don't deserve you. I know, in fact, this is why she's going to respond. And she kind of does this little bantering back and forth. It's kind of almost a comedic moment and all. Um, I almost was going to have Alan Russell uh, come up here and try to do some sarcasm for you because he, he kind of knows how to do that. And, 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 you know, and he, or Sherman. Uh, I, was thinking about, I was thinking about having Michael Sherman and, and Alan Russell both come up here and kind of do some quips back and forth and all. Like, you know, wouldn't that be kind of fun and all? But then I was like, you know, well, what, what thoughts should I give them? It won't matter. They'll go at it without. It. So, <laughs> but I did Steve Rubley instead. So, <laughs> but but here's the thing. She she she's talking to him and she says, "You're right." And she says, I, "I have no right to come here and ask you anything, but I am going to ask this. Have mercy on me. I need something that only you can give. I've, I've heard about you. And, and you have to understand that this is an area, remember, there were people from Tyre and Sidon who went around this area who actually were down at Galilee where Jesus was performing miracles, raising the dead, all kinds of stuff. They know. He's already come slightly into this territory once before and now he's going to go clear across it. And this woman has heard and seen and knows enough that this is the only guy that can help her. And so she goes to him, Jesus, Jesus, I have no rights to ask you this. I, 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 I shouldn't even be here. I know you, you shouldn't even be talking to me. But, but I believe you're merciful. I believe you're gracious. I believe you care. Uh, and Jesus, please have mercy on me. And, and really, Jesus, it's not for me. But my daughter's demon-possessed right now. Demon's just beating her up, hurting her bad, Jesus. Would you please... Would you please heal her? So see, I'm, I'm not even coming for me, Jesus. And, and all I want is the crumbs. I just want the little extra. Isn't Israel supposed to give the little extra to the nations? <clears throat> you see, 
easy. Even the dogs get to eat the children's crumbs that fall off the table. I know I'm not a Jew. I know I'm not part of the covenant people. I know I'm on the outside. I know I belong to an idolatrous country, an idolatrous race. I know all that. I know you are in the privileged position. The Jews are in the privileged position. I know that. But don't the benefits spill off to the rest of us? Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus says, wow, that's faith. That's faith. Your daughter's well. She'll go home, find her laying on the bed. Who knows why? Maybe because uh, the demon had been so whooping on her like so often happened. But here's something we need to understand. There's a message here, and it keeps coming out. And it's something we can't hide as we keep going through the Gospel of Mark. Have you noticed how many times in every single chapter there's something that's being stated about the authority over evil, about the power to actually defeat demons? Jesus has authority, and he wants people to be set free. It's interesting, John MacArthur, who has some pretty strong feelings against some of the present uh, uh, activity of demons and all, he makes this statement. He says, speaking on the horrible state of demon possession. Quote, I think much more common in the world today than we understand or the demons want us to understand. John MacArthur, who probably has a a pretty rigid view of of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts and things like that. In fact, he just did a conference trying to actually say, no, there's all these spiritual gifts that aren't present today. I mean, he was really attacking stuff, and yet he himself is saying, I think there's a lot more to it than we understand or than the demons want us to understand. Mark 1, man is thrown into convulsions, isn't he? And then God sets the demon out of him. The demoniac comes to him and pleads. And, and, and he says, you know, you know, what do you have to do with us, Jesus? And Jesus casts out thousands of demons from this man. And Mark 9, a boy will be thrown into convulsions again. And in this story, this young lady, why has she ended up on the bed? Because the demon probably was still trying to beat her up and Jesus is setting her free. What did Luke say? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. So if the Son sets you free, John 8, you shall be free indeed. That's what Paul said. It's Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Jesus, Jesus wants to set people free. And folks, we, oh my, be careful with thinking. There's no demons today. Just bad people, right? Be careful thinking that no, no, there's no stuff that those spiritual forces aren't really out there. I mean, come on, at least we know that no Christian is going to be influenced by a demon, right? Folks, we need to be much more wise with the, what the word says to us. The Bible, when it uses the word Dionizomai, transliterates that in most cases when we translate, and we translate it as demon-possessed. The word is actually demonized. Can a Christian be owned by a demon? I should be hearing a loud no. Let me ask it again. Can a Christian be owned by a demon? Thank you. You cannot be owned by a demon. But don't demons attack Bother, yes. harass. harass, thank you, <laughs> oppress, yep. but you can't be owned by one, right? But, can't, but, but don't demons, in fact, didn't scripture warn us to get rid of bitterness and make sure that we forgive because if we don't, what do we do? We give a foothold, whoa, a foothold. That's like, here, Satan, come in, I'm going to give you a room in my house. Whoa! 
Folks, there's some spiritual things that are happening and we've got to be more courageous and bold and not theologically afraid of. And we have power through Jesus Christ to defeat evil. And that even includes casting out demons. What do you need from Jesus today? I need Bill to finish because I'm hungry and want to go on. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Do you know it? And notice I didn't say, don't, do you know it here? Do you know it here? Does your heart tell you, Jesus loves me? You see, Jesus is looking for faith. Is he finding it in you? Do you believe him? Jesus wants you to be free. Are you free? Are there demons that, that are oppressing you? And you know, couldn't they have names like, what, addiction? Would that be a demon? Alcoholism? Overeating? Overspending? Would those be things that evil might attack us? Unforgiveness? Oh, I was coming to that one. <laughs> spirit of fear? We do not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. So that means spirit of fear is a bad thing. Fear, anxiety, depression. Couldn't these be things that evil is attacking us with? God wants us to be free. Jesus wants to set you free. Let me wrap up with this little story. Times... Tough times and tough things that we're facing are actually times of opportunity. Times of opportunity. Some of you know that we have missionaries who minister in Burkina Faso. We've supported those missionaries. Michael is hoping to go there in November, except guess what? This week on Thursday, there was a military coup. Uh, without going into the details of the military coup, already there have been some people that have died. Um, it's, they were supposed to do elections in October. <laughs> That's why the military coup took place, because they don't want the elections. They want to have a dictator. They want to have the, their military leader to be in power. <clears throat> Michael writes, please continue the prayers for Burkina. It looks like a resolution, resolution might be coming soon. Still a long ways to go, and a lot of issues have happened. I want to share a story that has touched me deeply. Some of you remember that we've supported a mobile clinic that <clears throat> Tiffany actually set up as a nurse and trained local people as nurses to run the mobile clinic. And the mobile clinic was out when they plant churches and all. And the mobile clinic was all set to go for evangelism and, and treatment this weekend, yesterday and today. With pharmacies, banks, and almost everything closed, many in Ouagadougou are left with no options. Everyone's, everything's closed down because of the coup. It's a frightening place to be. Nobody's out on the streets. And if they are out on the streets, they're rioting, and that's creating a whole other danger. While most people are stuck hiding in their homes, the staff has been out helping the neighbors. They have treated over 40 people who have no access to treatments. They have even treated several pregnant women. Using their phones to call the doctor and get a diagnosis helps them give appropriate meds to those who have no other options. I am so proud of them and their willingness to allow God to use them amidst the chaos. They're the Christian church of 250 going into the streets when it's dangerous in many ways and they're out in a Ouagadougou and what does Jesus want for us Father God you want people to be free and I pray Jesus that today if there's people here that are battling evil in some kind of way that they would come to you and allow you to send that darkness away and God, I know there's some things that, are, that we're battling, and it's simply because of us and our choices. It's our own sin. But there's other things that are spiritual in nature, and we need your spiritual power to, to um, send those demons away. <laughs> there are people who need to be set free from, from past pain and wrong and hurt and stuff, and you want to give them new life. There are people that need to be set free to know that you love them. 
and the nations need to hear, and that includes our neighbors, that you love them. And we need to be willing to do what's dangerous. I pray for the, the team that's there in Ouagadougou ministering to the people there uh, of the streets of Burkina Faso. Protect them and bless them and help us 